Is beer lagering still necessary or is it just a mythical ritual? Well, in this video, Distinguished Brewing Sciences Professor Dr. Charlie Bamsforth shares his beer lagering insights. And be sure to stay to the end and hear Professor Bamsforth's explanation of yeast-generated DMS and spunding. And please check out the links in the description as there's a ton of additional resources there too. But we're going to be talking about lager beers. And I've got a question, a burning question that I hear a lot, and I don't answer it very well, but I bet you will. So what defines a lager beer? And how would you distinguish it from an ale or a pilsner? Doug, it's nice to be with you. And basically, a lager is whatever you say it is on the label. There's a famous story from years ago of a brewing company in England, and they had a beer called Long Life, which was a beer originally marketed as beer for the can, as in the container, not a room in the house. And when the English finally discovered lager, they, they said, we need to get onto that bandwagon, and they just changed the label and called it a lager. So that's the sort of cynical way of defining a lager. And I'm sure there are people in the world who would insist that a lager is where you've got decoction mashing and you've got a certain type of yeast, and then you've got prolonged maturation, the lagering process, lager being the word for st to store. I would say that strictly speaking, a lager is a beer that is fermented using lager yeast, Saccharomyces pastorianus. So any beer that is, is fermented using this lager yeast is a lager and any other product is an ale. So of course, Pilsner is one type of lager originating in Pilsen in the Czech Republic. And of course, we've got an example of that today, but uh, ales basically are those beers fermented with Saccharomyces cerevisiae and lagers Saccharomyces pastorian, otherwise known as bottom fermenting yeast, whereas ale, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, is top fermenting yeast. When we mentioned Pilsner, how would you distinguish that from an ale or a lager? The Pilsner is a type of lager, simple as that. And a lot of people, they use the term synonymously. So for a lot of people, if you ask them the question, the non-experts and non-aficionados, should we say, if you said to them, what's a lager? And they would basically use the term a lager pilsner interchangeably. But of course, pilsner is just one type of lager of a certain style. There are so many other lagers. There are lagers that have got smoky bacon flavors. There are lagers that are black. There are lager with some degree of roasted carrot. And of course, we're going to come and be tasting Scott Ungerman's Pride and Joy from his last major role in, in the industry, Anchor Steam, which is a lager for the simple reason that it's produced using Saccharomastorianus, but actually working under ale fermentation and maturation conditions. The polar opposite of that would be the beer in Germany, the Kush, which is an ale yeast that is, is produced using lager type processing. But I remember if I could segue slightly to at the time I was in a brewery not too long ago in London, and I was tasting the ales and the lagers beforehand. And then I did the tour and I knew the brewmaster, she used to be a colleague of mine. And I said, so how many yeasts you've got in this brewery? She said, just the one. So she said, I guess our lagers are strictly speaking koshers. The cynical view is whatever you want to describe it at. And I know that there's lots of beers about where brewers are only, have only got one yeast strain. And there's, there's a lot to be said for only having one yeast strain. It avoids a lot of complications and keeps things nice and simple. But they're producing a wide range of products and with lots of interesting labels on them. But strictly speaking, a lager is fermented using the bottom fermenting Saccharomyces pasta. So the, the Pilsner is actually a relatively new style of lagers, is it not? Yeah, it originated, and Pilsner in the Czech Republic, of course, originated when the good bosses, the council and the, these sort of dignitaries in the Pilsen in what was then, I think, still Bohemia, these days, the Czech Republic, the people of Pilsen were unhappy with their beer. They didn't think it was very good. And so they went out and about, appointed a, a great brewmaster called Gross, and he went off, learned how to make uh, certain types of pale malts in, I think, in England. I think he uh, basically uh, spirited away some yeast from Germany and put these together in, in the style which we now know as Pilsner beer. Yeah. But yeah, 
still in Germany, some of the ales are called alts. The old style was so the old, the old older style of brewing, the ale fermentation technology. But then lagers progressively came in, particularly when brewers were forbidden from brewing in the summer months and and uh, they wanted beers that were brewed and then aged and matured and stored in cellars and i don't think we really want to dig too deep into the history today but I, what we really need to be talking about is is it possible for pretty much any brewer on any scale to make a lager beer and i would argue the case is absolutely yes so there is no reason why any home brewer for example should be intimidated by the concept of producing a lager style beer. They can do it. So in the chat, there's a good bit of discussion that, and Crispy was asking this, aren't lagers technically fermented cold? So what do you think about temperatures, in, especially in the realm of anybody brewing a lager? I will, a little later on, I'd like to hold my fire on that, but I will point out that for a good number of years, I was with the Bass Brewing Company in UK. Um, we, in our stable of products, the biggest selling brand of beer was Carling Black Label. And this still, I understand, is the number one beer brand in the UK, certainly in England. And uh, let me tell you that, that the, some fairly high temperatures were employed in the production of Carling Black Label. It was a lager yeast. And yeah, the lager yeast, if you analyze Saccharomyces pastoris, it, it is less tolerant of temperature than Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but it, it's not that sensitive. So of course, traditionally in Germany, they might be fermenting as low as six degrees Celsius. And I make no apologies again, Doug, I will only use Celsius. So everybody's going to have to translate it, but six degrees Celsius. So it's fairly cold. Well, let me tell you that, that one of the ways of differentiating ale yeast and lager yeast is will it grow at 37 degrees Celsius, blood temperature? And ale strains will grow at 37. Now, lager strains won't, but they will certainly grow. At, and yes, you'll get a different flavor spectrum, but who is to say what's right and what's wrong? It's what you want. And if you produce a beer in a certain style, there's no magic descriptor that you have to have there for lager beers. And later on, we'll talk about a flavor note that I personally like, and uh, is certainly a feature of lagers pr produced in England, but which the Germans hate. And yet the Germans have got it in their beer, more so than the English. Whether it should be or there should not be S's in there, there's no rule about what that should be, as long as you make your beer consistently every time. So can you make a lager using higher fermentation conditions? Yes, you can. You certainly can. Again, it comes back to yeah, are you using a lager yeast? That strictly is the only differentiation as far as I'm concerned. And just a word there, Doug, about this yeast. You can't isolate lager yeast from nature. So you can isolate ale yeast separate all over the world in nature, but you can't isolate from the, from the wild, you can't isolate lager yeast. It arose relatively recently in the way of things, and we're talking hundreds of years and not millions, it arose by an ale yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, merging, melding with a yeast called Saccharomyces eubionis, which actually is a wine yeast. Now, eubionis, you can isolate from nature. So the way I like to describe it is somebody dimmed the lights, played some soft music, and these two yeast strains got together and merged, and they made Saccharomyces pastorianus, which is... It's got 50% more DNA than ale yeast. It's more complex. It's got more enzyme potential to make different types of enzyme. So yeah, it does prefer lower temperatures, but it's not precluded from, it doesn't, it's not prevented from fermenting at higher temperatures. One of the beers that you suggested would, that would be very illustrative of our talks was the Pilsner Urkel. Absolutely. You right. want to get into why you chose a Pilsner Urkel? It's, po it's possibly one of the most famous lager beers there is. Of course, the, the word Urquell means original source. So Pilsner Urkel is, is basically the original beer from Pilsen in the Czech Republic. And let me tell you, and I will say this now, that there are certain characteristics or a certain characteristic of Pilsner Urquell that I'm personally not a fan of. But they drink more beer in the Czech Republic than any other country in the world. So who am I to say it's wrong? But I think you've got a bit of a film clip here, 
Doug, have you not? I put actually three of them to, together from Václav Berka, the, who is the head brewer emeritus at the Pilsner Urquell. And he's just, he's been nice enough to put a couple of these together and may have some more for us. Hello, brewmasters. I'm very glad that you decided to make a tasting of Pilsner Urquell. I'm staying in front of historical gate of Pilsner Brewery. And this is brewery which gives to the beer category Pilsner. Here in Pilsen, we brew the beer from 1295, when King Wenzel II delegated to all citizens privilege brew the beer. But because the quality was variable, citizens decided to build this new and modern brewery and was born excellent beer Pilsner Urquell. It was different because still this time the beer here in Bohemia was dark and cloudy because of using dark malt and upper fermentation yeast. But starting with this beer in Pilsen, we started with using pale malt. We started with using bottom fermentation and started with brewing beer in this new modern brewery. I'm just in brew house of Pilsner Urquell. And Pilsner Urquell is from beginning to nowadays, brewed only from three ingredients. Very soft Pilsner water, Pilsner malt, which we produce in our own malting plant. And typically for this malt, it's a low modified and produced for our Czech variety of barley and for hopping. We are using salts hops, which gives to the beer pleasant bitterness and very nice hoppy aroma. And we still use for brewing three mesh decoction in this copper kettle. And we use it because copper kettle with direct heating gives to the beer nice little bit caramel tones. And for fermentation, we are using our special strain of yeast and we are using low temperature for fermentation and low temperature for maturation, but we will see it in the cellars. Hi brewers, we are just in cellars where it's ongoing maturation of Pilsner beer. And we are in historical cellars because we let here in Pilsen still this one department. When we continue with fermentation and maturation in wooden vats and wooden barrels, to assure that our beer in cylindroconical tanks have the same taste and same drinkability like in these wooden barrels. And what we observe by tasting, of course, firstly, we are looking for the color, nice golden color, creamy head. Then we try aroma. In aroma, you can feel a little bit multi-tones because we are a higher portion of residual extract. You can feel sad hops and a little bit tones of diacetyl and caramel, which are characteristic for Pilsen Urca. There are no fruity tones or very low level. And uh, then we try to taste the beer. Mm. Nice, very pleasant bitterness is the first in the first sip. But the bitter taste is very well balanced in short time the sweetness of this residual extract. And both these parameters are leading to another sip. And this is drinkability. Enjoy it. Yeah, that is a bucket trip list without a doubt. I'm envious of anybody that gets to do that one. Have you been there, Charlie? I haven't, but there's one word that, that I really don't like, and that's diacetyl. Yeah, but did I, yours have any? I'm getting ready to open mine, but I yeah, usually don't taste diacetyl in them anymore. No, Why do you think no, that no, is? No. As I'm fond of saying, beer is never better than when it's first been brewed, consumed as close to the brewery as possible. This beer has traveled a long way. If I look at the label, there's absolutely no no indication of when it was brewed, how old this is. But 
But, and I'm not being disrespectful. I think they're a wonderful brewing company and they've got great ideals and principles. But uh, this beer is stale and any, any diacetyl that was on it has completely disappeared. Um, so I understand. I know it's supposed to be there. My, one of the people I brought into the industry years ago was Catherine Smart, these days Professor Catherine Smart. And when she was with a previous employer, of course, they produced Pilsner Urquhart. And she would give it to me. And I said, no, I can't drink that. I, can't. I don't like the diacetyl. But that's, that diacetyl has been replaced now with age character in this product. And so there's so much to be said for, for whether it's brewing under license or building a brewery close to where you want to sell it and so on. I understand you don't have the romance of that beautiful old facility and the, that beautiful location in the, Pil- in, in the Czech Republic. But what you're trading is that tradition and that all those messages and the branding and so on with the fact that it's traveled thousands of miles through whoever knows what set of conditions and who's, how they've been stored and so on. And by the time it gets to me now, it is not the Pilsner Urkel as I would expect to be consuming it if I went to the Czech Republic. So it's got a very pronounced, grainy, harsh character, what I've got in front of me now. It's 4.4% I- ABV. It's 40, 4.4% ABV, 40 IBU. None of that diacetyl character. And I can't get any of the late hop character. Now, I love Sartre's hops. It's possibly my favorite hop variety. And of course, what he was talking about was the late hop character, where adding a proportion of those Sartre's hops very late in kettle boil. And so that some of the character will come through, it'll be modified, it'll be transformed by the yeast, and you'll get certain enzyme catalyzed changes taking place to give this very subtle late hop character. So we're not talking the intense dry hop character you get on, say, a US or a North American IPA. We're talking about this subtle late hop character. I'm quite sure that if I got on an airplane and I flew over there, I'd get it, even amongst all the diacetyl, but uh, I'm not getting it here. So th- this beer has not traveled well. It's not traveled well. And nobody who is consuming at Pilsner Urquhart in this country is not sampling. I is generally held up to be their form of excellence in the Czech Republic. I'm wittering on about it, but freshness to me is so important. And it looked great, didn't it? When he was holding up with the candle and so on and drinkability. When you've got some of the characters that I'm getting in this product, that's not going to be talk. That's not drinkability. We're going to be talking about different kinds of lagers. So how would you characterize? Is there a term? For the Pilsner that would distinguish it, for example, the the Anchor Steam we've got coming up? There are different types of lagers. So this is a Pilsner, obviously. The name's on the label. And as I think, as you said to me earlier on, if if you're in the Czech Republic and you ask for a a Pilsner, they're going to give you Pilsner Urquhart, despite the fact that there are other brands. Uh, Bass used to have a brand called Staropraman in the Czech Republic. And of course, then there's Budvar. But of course, there are many other types of lagers. And we're going to be having two of those later on, or I certainly am, and I think you are too, Doug. But there are many others. There are Roche beers. Those are the ones made with the smoked malt, which are particularly popular in Bamberg. And irrespective of whether you you buy this country, you can buy the, the famous company that produces them, and you can buy the Metzen, which is the March, the spring beer. And you can buy the Urbok, which is a stronger lager. But when it comes to that particular type of product, the Roche beer, they've all got this smoky character due to when they dry the malt, they've got a stream of burning beech wood there, which is giving this smoky bacon type of character. So I've mentioned the box, and there are many different types of box as well. There are darker box, there are my box, there are doable box, and these tend to be stronger. You usually got a goat on the label because that's a symbol of strength. The Mertzens, which tend to be more of the multi side of things. The Hellas, of course, the pale, and we've got an example of that later on. The Schwartz beers, which are black lagers, and I'm missing others. And of course, California Common, with the, the only example that can be labeled as steam beer, of course being anchor steam beer, because Fritz Maytag protected that term. So many people think lager, it's, it's got to be made by decoction mashing. And he used the term a direct fire as well. And it, you've got to have all of that technology. You've got to have this prolonged storage in those beautiful cellars and stuff. No, you don't need any of that. The decoction mashing originated from a time 
when the bulb wasn't of the best quality and in, in times when they didn't even have thermometers to monitor temperature, but they worked it out by trial and error how to get the most out of not the best malt in the world. These days, we have wonderful mod malts modified to the extent that they want. He mentioned not particularly well modified. Obviously, they're looking for a, fairly amount, a fair amount of residual extract. They feel that's right for that product. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can make perfectly good lagers that have essentially no residual extract. They're very popular in the United States of America. So there's no rule about why you have to do all those things. Now, if Pilsner Urquell went from the triple decoction mashing, they didn't have the, that particular malt, and they fermented at a different temperature, and they didn't have prolonged maturation, yeah. would it be different? Yes, it would be different. So... The golden rule to quality for any brand is to do things the same every time. So the customer is getting what they expect to, to have. And if any of those things change, then yeah, if any of the process changes change, you'd expect the product to be different. But that doesn't mean you have to start with that. So if you bring developing a new beer and producing a new brand, even if it's a brand in your own home, you don't have to do it that way. You can do it in other ways and still bake lager beer. And, uh, and of course, if you are wanting to present to the customer the same beer every time, it brings me back to the fact that a beer that's traveled thousands of miles without any particular precautions to keep it fresh, like cold distribution, you are not giving the customer the product that you are proud of. Charlie, we're going to move on to the Anchor Steam shortly. But as we contrast the two, what do you think about maturation time? Do you have any idea what the maturation time is at per Pilsner or Kell, maybe versus uh, Anchor Steam? I would think it would be shorter in, in Anchor Steam, and I'm sure Scott will correct me if I'm wrong on that. But with Pilsner Urquhart, I think part of the romance is the uh, the prolonged period spent in those lagering cellars. But even Anchor Steam, I would think, is probably slower than the example that I'll let you hear about a little bit later on. I, I know Fritz Maytag quite well, of course. No, no longer is he at the helm at Anchor Steam, but he used to describe it as the last medieval brewery. Welcome to the last medieval brewery. And and uh, very proud of the malt and hop character on that. But uh, the character of Anchor Steam is very different, a very different nature to what we've just been tasting. Can you speculate how long you think Pilsner Raquel has oh, to mature? I would say it's a period of several weeks, if not a small number of months, I would say. I, um, I will ask Voslav. Now, I did ask Scott Ungerman, since that yep. was our main topic. And Scott said that Anchor Steam is about two weeks, maybe a little more, depending on where the diacetyl is. I'm intrigued by that, and I, I should have a beer with him sometime and go and ride through the diacetyl. But let me tell you, it's it's fairly straightforward to get quite a lot of diacetyl, and I believe it's very straightforward to get no diacetyl. But achieving a specific finite amount of diacetyl, which is detectable but not making you stink of popcorn, buttered popcorn all the time. I, I would think that's that's quite a challenge. Perhaps it is the sort of the maturation time that is one of the controlling factors. Perhaps we should take a look at Scott in action. It is a it's a rich multi complex lager, but the fermentation produces the aromatics that are key to what makes Anchors so unique and really is the ester profile and the esters are produced in that relatively warm open fermentation with very low static head pressure on the yeast allows it to really kick out some esters and those esters give you that floral bouquet and some nice fruitiness that is why I think a lot of people First, when they taste it, believe it's an ale, but it is a lager that's fermented in a different way. And it's really the ester profile that jumps out. It's a beautiful amber colored liquid with a nice tan head of foam. It's very effervescent. It's well carbonated. And the aromatics that come out of the glass when you first approach it are certainly 
the caramel malt and the maltiness, but then the ester profile is right there, especially as it warms up. And the isoamyl acetate, the banana ester, is one of the most prevalent ones that jumps out. So you've got maltiness, you've got bananas, you've also got other esters that are prominent, a little rose note sometimes, and they do shift a little bit. It's not as one thing with lager beers is they're very consistent when they're done the same, but there's a profile that I think jumps in and out that sometimes is a little more floral and sometimes a little more fruity in those esters. And then the hops are there as well. And they're distinctive American hops that, that, that marry well with those malts and those esters. So that it's all three of those things coming together. And then as you taste it, there's a nice malty sweetness and then a gentle hop bitterness. It's not overpoweringly bitter. It's not harsh on the back of your throat. And it finishes with a crispness that you'd expect from a lager beer but also has a long hop finish and the retro nasal of the esters once again that jumps out. So fresh work that you're bringing into a whirlpool tank where there's a relatively short whirlpool rest of only about 15 minutes and then you're, got, you're cooling into the fermenter, cooling to 60 degrees Fahrenheit exactly into a 60 degree room into an empty fermenter, clean fermenter that is a shallow pan open fermenter that's really only, if you haven't seen pictures of it, it's only about three feet deep. And you come in and pitch the yeast manually via bucket and allow then that free rise fermentation to eventually warm all the way up to well over 70 degrees. And then it, it cools a bit as the yeast activity dies down. On day three, it is dropped to a secondary lagering tank. And when I say dropped, it's gravity. It's just a straight drop and it takes it down from the third floor where the fermentation cellar is down to the first floor where the lager cellar is and put in tanks at an 85% fill level. Then a, another brew is brewed that same day that it's dropped and will come on top less than a day later at a 15% rate. Also coming in warm into a cellar that is a 60 degree cellar. So once again, not that cold. And then the tanks are bunged up and allowed to build pressure on their own so that a natural carbonation occurs over that two week period after two weeks. Those tanks have no cooling jackets on them whatsoever. So they're considered done once they're tasted and analyzed and then they'll be moved through finishing when needed. And finishing is a centrifuge and then a plate and frame filter. Another awesome brewer and awesome beer. Oh, you got a can. I, I've got it in a can. And this is one thing Pilsner Echo could do. They could put it in a can. It'll, the longest shelf life <laughs> Mark, in the Mark can. Mark Brungard said he's found it in the can. Oh, it's going to be fresher than a, but brilliant stuff. The, anybody who's worried about temperature, th this is a beer, as Scott has said, that has got relatively warm fermentation and maturation. And of course, those esters are because it's in that, A, the higher temperatures, but B, the low pressure on the yeast. If you, if the more hydrostatic pressure on the yeast, then the less the ester profile you're going to produce. So this is a yeast that's working quite speedily, but not under pressure. And so you're getting these beautiful esters, the, the isoamyl acetate. Scott mentioned the rose character, that would be phenyl ethyl acetate. And so the esters are very important for this beer. A lot of people, the simple way you can identify many lagers is they tend to have a, a reasonable amount of sulfur character. But here's a lager that is clearly estery. As I think somebody said in the commentary and looking at your glass, even more so than mine, beautiful color as well. And a rich caramel-like characteristic coming from some, some proportion of specialty malt in there as well. Delicious beer. And no diacetyl. And no diacetyl. You know, no DMS. No DMS. But uh, was something Scott said there, and he talked about the Whirlpool stand, he pointed out it was 15 minutes. As I will tell you momentarily, that one of the ways to actually get more DMS, if you want it, is a long whirlpool step, because that is very important in converting what we call the precursor of DMS into DMS. Perhaps I could just go in and tell you what how we used to do our lager in, in Bass. 
because it's an exercise in how things can be done. And let me stress, this was a beer. This is the most popular beer in England. So it's Carling Black Label. Mr. Carling originally was a Yorkshireman, but he emigrated to Canada. And so this, when the English finally discovered lager beers in the late 60s, early 70s, this was the beer that Bass got interested in. Now, it's fairly pale malt, of course, fairly lightly dried, but he specified a precursor level for the DMS. Let me just go back and say that in, in the early 70s, the Brewing Research Foundation in England they analyzed all these German beers. They wanted to know what it was. What was the characteristic of these Germanic Hellas-type beers? And the thing that was on all of them, the flavor that the English were associating with lagers was DMS, dimethyl sulfide, which, you know, the characteristic is sweet corn, okay? So the, the, the brewers were deciding you needed a certain amount of DMS, not too little because you didn't have lager character, but not too much because then it, it went more over and more in the black current area. And that most of the DMS comes from a precursor, which is in the malt. It's called SMM. Some people call it DMSP for DMS precursor. And this is broken down by heat. So you've got to regulate the kilning on the malt. If you have not too much kilning, if you have fairly light colored malt, then you get more of this DMS precursor. But if you heat it more intensely, you get less of it. So we specified how much of this precursor should be present in the malt. Then we mashed infusion mashing, no decoction mashing, wasted time and effort. So we mashed, we started off at a low temperature to allow the beta gluconases to carry on. But then we ramped it up after about 20 minutes to conversion temperature. And we also tipped in beta gluconase as well for good measure. Then I've lauted it and got the wort. Then we boiled for one hour, a vigorous boil. And when you boil, you break down this precursor to DMS. And if you've got a vigorous rolling boil, that DMS, a lot of it goes up the stack and is lost. Okay. It's the number one thing that's coming off the stack alongside the hot oils and so on. Okay. But we boiled for an hour and then we went into the whirlpool for one hour, one hour in the hot work receiver, the whirlpool. And what was happening in the work, hot work receiver was any SMM, the precursor that did not get broken down in the boil, now it was broken down in the whirlpool, which was still approaching 100 degrees Celsius. But of course, the whirlpool is very gentle. So the liquid is swirling around and the DMS that's produced doesn't volatilize it doesn't go off okay so you end up with a word with quite a lot of dms in it then you cool it and ferment okay and during fermentation of course quite a lot of this dms comes off with the carbon dioxide but substantial amount remained so that's how we controlled the level of dms by specifying the precursor in the malt and then having a one hour boil and a one hour whirlpool stand now, for many brewers, the yeast also makes quite a lot of DMS. So you've got to control those fermentation conditions. And the lower the fermentation temperature, the more the yeast makes DMS from something called DMSO. So as long as you control all those things, you can hit on the level of DMS you want. If you don't want, if you don't want DMS in your beer, then you have a malt which has got a low level of precursor and you have a vigorous boil for a long time and a very short whirlpool stand, and you ferment it at fairly high temperatures, okay? If you do want DMS, then you do it the way I described it. Now, when we fermented, we were fermenting at fairly high temperatures because our DMS was coming from the breakdown of the precursor, but we're fermenting at reasonably high temperatures. I'm thinking from memory, so many years ago now, but I'm thinking 12, 13, 14 degrees Celsius, okay? And halfway through the fermentation, we took the cooling off. We allowed the temperature to rise, and it rose by about 3 degrees Celsius. So things went faster. And the most important thing that was happening was we were getting rid of diacetyl, but also the related pentane diol 
And also, we, of course, we, we had to make sure we got rid of the precursors, the things that are converted into diacetyl and pentane diol. And once we were convinced or measured the fact that all of those materials were down below a certain level, and once, of course, we achieved the final attenuation, then we centrifuged off the yeast, green beer centrifuge, and we took the beer to minus one Celsius for three days to chill out proteins and polyphenols and so on. And then we filtered, stabilized, and packaged. And the argument being that we could get the kegs and the bottles back all the quicker if we weren't storing the beer for weeks or months on end. So basically, the maturation period was about three days. So we've gone from five to six weeks to two weeks in the anchor steam. And you've talked a lot about DMS. And I think DMS is a big part of the profile of the next beer. Yeah. So this is Spaten. Uh, Spaten is one of the original lager beers from Munich. Back in M- M- Munich, they used to have darker beers called the Munchners. But the Spaten company... And the famous name there is a guy called Sedlmeier. He and his colleagues came up with this, a paler version of the product. And this is a Hellas. This is a Hell, Hellas style beer. Very pale indeed. So if you pour it out, you'll see that the color is extremely gentle. It's extremely. And what that means is that there's a lot of this DMS precursor in there. Okay. This SMM precursor is in there and so when they process it they're going to generate a lot of dms so this product has got a lot of sulfur on the nose and if the closest you're going to get to this in the united states is rolling rock so rolling rock is made from extremely pale malt and i'm pretty confident they too have a long hot work stand a lot long whirlpool stand And so you're generating a a lot of DMS. So as I say, lagers often are err on the side of sulfur rather than esters. Now, just going back to calling black label, you would say to me, surely if you're fermenting at higher temperatures, you're going to produce that much more ester. And the answer is yes, you are. But it, it was part of the signature of that product. There is no absolute right and wrong. You can have lagers that have got diacetyl in them. I don't like them. I like my lagers with DMS in them. Not everybody does. But this, to me, is a very good um, pale lager beer. So I'm getting some degree of bready character. I'm getting the maltiness, which you had to expect. I'm getting that 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 sweet corn type of character. Not particularly bitter. I think this one has got a bitterness around 21 IBU. It's 5.2% alcohol. Very refreshing, very drinkable beer. And fresh as well. Now, the one thing I would say about this one is there is just a suggestion of light struck on it. It is has got that degree of skunky character, as you'd expect, because here it's in a green glass bottle. I think you said, Doug, that in, in Germany it's in brown glass bottles. So quite why they have got this in a green glass bottle, I can't absolutely answer that question. I asked that question when I contacted them. Because they sent me back a picture with a like a look like a liter brown bottle, and I no. said, "Why in the world do you not ship those over here?" I hadn't got my answer yet, no. but I did get a short video from Charles Nowen. But you want me to show that? It's only about forty seconds long, but it's That's a tour cool. of the brewery. Yeah, I agree, Crispy. I think it's the Heineken influence. All right. So here's another. This just has music in the uh, video, and I did not shoot this. This came from Charles Nowen. And so here we go.
So I'm going to try and get more details. So that was just a quick, <laughs> mostly just the same, some of the highlights of his tour. Yeah, just to say in passing that uh, Spartan, of course, these days is part of the AB InBev Corporation. Of course, uh, Anchor Steam is, is owned by Sapporo these days. And Pilsner Air Call, of course, Asahi. I, I noticed from the questions there that somebody said yeast can't make DMS. I can assure you most definitely it does make DMS because I did all that work. And the enzyme that does it is called methylene sulfoxide reductase. And it's a three-protein system with thyroidoxin and thyroidoxin reductase. And it happens to use DMSO as well as methylene sulfoxide, but not as efficiently. But it does make DMS. Charlie, I've lined up the uh, beers. I thought that might make an interesting comparison in the color. I intentionally use the same glassware. Let me squish them together a little bit. So the one with the least in it, and that's just because I started with it, is the Pilsner Urkel. The middle one, the darker orangey copper color is the Anchor Steam. And then, of course, the lightest one in the group is the Spotten. Yeah. And all beautiful appearances there as well. So congratulations on your last handling there, Mr. Piper. They're all very appealing in appearance. And of course, the foam is the foam is, is very important, particularly in the Czech Republic. If I could just segue slightly and ask facetiously, I'm not sure if the volumes of beer in the Czech Republic include that foam. So if they're serving glasses full of foam, then... <laughs> and they're calling it a liter, then that may explain something. But I'm being facetious and just being a bit naughty. Now, Keith makes an interesting point. He said that you were the first one to publish that yeast makes DMS. We were the first pe people to show what it makes it from. And other people had speculated before that yeast made DMS. In fact, when I joined the Bass Brewing Company, they uh, they said, welcome to Bass, our yeast does not make DMS. But it does, because I, I showed it as well. So we were the people to show that it was dimethyl sulfoxide. So very briefly, what happens is when you kill malt, you actually produce DMSO as well. Now... The reality is that the more robustly you kill the malt, the higher the temperatures you go to, curing temperatures, you produce more DMSO. You produce under those conditions, and then the DMSO, which is not volatile, very soluble, the yeast will reduce typically about 10 to 20% of it into DMS. There was a famous study from, the, from Interbrew back in the day in, in Leuven, and they used labels to show that 80%, 80% of the DMS, presumably in Stella Artois, actually comes from DMSO reduction by. So there is absolutely no doubt that yeast does make DMS and DMSO, but I don't consider it important as a specification, the DMSO levels, because you've got so much DMS precursor, S-methylmethane and SMM, that really overrides it But, but it, for most beers. But yeast does make DMS from DMS. And the lower the fermentation temperature, the more it does it. So if you've got the classic Germans at six, eight degrees Celsius, that yeast is more making more DMS than, say, it was working at 12, 14 degrees Celsius, which is why at Bass, for Carling, we focused on the, the SMM. So, Charlie, we promised to go over carbonation and uh, spunding and some of the various things. Can you touch on that? Yeah, so one of the traditional roles for lagering was all to do with natural carbonation. Well, of course, these days, in this day and age, you can actually have car carbonation using pinpoint injection and this sort of technology. There are membranes that are available, hydrophobic membranes, that are very exciting to me because not only can you adjust the carbonation, but you can also use them to remove oxygen. And if you're tempted to put nitrogen into your beer, you can use them as a way to introduce nitrogen. I'm fascinated. The word spunding, it, it, it's something that in my, ever since I was joined the industry in 1978, is not a word that has been in my vocabulary. And indeed, my dear friend who I've known for more than 50 years, Chris Bolton, I was interested to see whether he had the word in his dictionary of brewing, and he does not have the word spunding in there. But of course, what we're talking about is basically putting a cap on the fermenter and, and keeping the CO2 in that fermenter. The only things I would say about that are these. If you do put more pressure on that yeast, you, you will suppress the production of any esters. Now, you may want that. And, but the only other thing I would say is be very careful and follow the guidelines and, 
I know there are things called spunding valves and so on. Be very careful because you don't want to explode anything, but it is obviously a one way of keeping the CO2 in there. Some people talk about whether the quality of the CO2 is different, whether it's produced naturally, for example, through a natural conditioning, bottle conditioning, are different to that when you have, say, pinpoint carbonation. There may be possible explanations for that. In fact, I've just written a paper for the Journal of the Institute of Brewing, which will be out soon, where I talk about the myths and the realities of prolonged maturation and whether it influences things like perceived carbonation. But there are various ways of doing it, but spunding, be careful. And if you've learned anything new, make sure to hit that like and subscribe and especially the notification bell. Share in the comments what you think about lagering. Your views, your comments and feedback help the channel out immensely. Note this is a highlights from a longer live event and the link is in the description.